Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at Telerik.com slash platform. That's Telerik.com slash platform. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 534. In this episode, Scott talks with Jessica Lord about creating cross-platform electron apps. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, we're talking with Jessica Lord. She works at GitHub on Electron. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I am shocked. I realized now as we do this remote uh, podcast that you're in Portland, so I could have brought my microphone to you. So for that, I apologize. (laughs) No worries. So you work on Electron, formerly Adam shell, Atom-shell. This is different than the Atom editor, right? It's a totally different thing. Yeah, it's actually the piece of software that Atom is built on. It was, And it was built originally for Atom because GitHub had the dream of building a text editor with web technologies, ones that you could totally hack with JavaScript. Um, and in order to build Atom, GitHub built... Electron, formerly called Adam Shell, mm. which speaks to how originally it really was just this dependency for Adam. Mm-hmm. And I remember when like Visual Studio Code, which is another editor similar to Adam, came out, people looked at it and they were like, oh, that's just Adam. They just <laughs> branded Adam again. And at that point, it like became officially confusing as to what was Adam and what was Adam Shell. What made you all is that is that kind of what made you all change the name? Yes, actually that 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 project in particular was the impetus. It was the moment where we were like, okay, people are doing really big things with this and even though Microsoft did build another text editor, mm-hmm. you you can build anything with Electron. And so it didn't make sense for everyone to be tied in name to a text editor. Yeah. And now that Electron is its own kind of platform, uh, there's all sorts of apps that you really can't really tell if they're Electron apps or not. I know that uh, Slack, the Slack Windows app is Electron, right? Yep. I think it's their Windows and Linux versions. Yeah. So there's lots of apps that are running cross-platform on Electron, but I still feel like people look at it and they go, oh, that's just Chrome in a box, (laughs) <laughs> they minimize it. Like they, you know, that's what programmers do, right? They, that's just is the way the conversation always starts. And right. It's a minimizing word. So let me just ask you, isn't this just like Chrome in a frame? No, it's so much more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's actually only a small part of Chrome, which is something that sets it apart from other tools like in WJS, which include a lot more of Chrome. Mm-hmm. Electron only includes Chrome's rendering engine. So only the part of Chrome that knows how to draw a web page to paint the elements on a screen. Um, that makes it really easy for Electron to stay up to date as Chrome is changing and updating itself mm-hmm. because there's much less of us, much less for us to worry about having to update when Chrome updates because we use just this portion of Chrome. But playing playing devil's advocate, what else is there in Chrome other than the thing that makes web pages? Um, like there's like the the tabs and there's the history and the settings and all that stuff, right? Yeah, and there's um the dev tools extensions and things like that. Um, um okay. and yeah, ex- the the world of extensions. So um, none of them in is, general is not even in there. Right. There are more and more dev tools extension. Or, yeah, DevTools extension APIs are being built into Electron now. That's something that has been happening mm-hmm. more actively over the past couple of weeks so that mm-hmm. 
people can use the React DevTools extension, Angular DevTools extension, Accessibility DevTools extension. Um, that that last one is still um, in the in progress, but basically we are re-implementing these Chrome extension APIs because we don't we don't uh, we don't pull in that part of Chrome into Electron originally. Mm-hmm. But so beyond Chrome, um, it's so it's got that Chromium rendering layer, mm-hmm. and then it's got the full Node API. So it's got all of Node in every context, and that's what makes it really more than just a, a, a web view, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. And and you can also think of it really as um, a UI for Node um, because you can just write Node in the way you normally would write a, a Node app. But mm-hmm. now you with Electron, you have access to um, native things like opening dialog boxes on three operating systems. And that's what the Chrome part enables you to do on top of just writing Node. And then what Node enables you to do instead of just writing web pages in Chrome is to access the file system. So you can save things and do anything that you can do to the file system with Node, you can now do in an HTML file in your Electron app. So what is running for lack of a better word, client side, and is there ever a server side? Like, is there a little Node web server locally ever? No, it's completely Node. The, node, the full Node API is available and throughout Electron, and so there really isn't um, a client side and server side per se. Mm-hmm. What changes in the Electron context is that you have two processes. You have the main process and the renderer process, and both of those have the full node API, but the main process specifically does the heavier lifting. So it's in this process that you would make calls to open dialog boxes, things that are more CPU intensive. And then the renderer process is the process that's actually drawing uh, your web page. And so you can use node in both of those processes. You can talk between the two processes, but you do do different things in those processes. Okay, so that is a really good explanation. That actually changes kind of my per- perception around how Electron fits into this world. So I'm going to paraphrase, and you tell me if I get this right. When we make a web app today and we navigate between two links, if the link is like a whole new page navigation, there's like a moment where we, our app, like winks out of existence, you know? But with an Electron app, I can have a whole separate process that can maintain state that is completely unrelated to my my UI renderer. Is that correct? Yes. So actually, each process you can sort of think of as a separate tab in Chrome. They're all independent. And so one thing, but they can all talk to each other. So um, you can have things happening in one process that don't slow down the rendering or impact what's happening at all in the other process, but it can still be working and sending messages. So is it like there are two tabs, but you just can't see them? There's, you can't see one of the tabs? It's an invisible tab? In a way. It, I mean, if you visualize it as Chrome, the main process is when you have Chrome open, but no windows and no tabs open, but you still have that menu bar there. It's the life cycle of the app. You can s- close it and open a new window from there. Um, and so that is like the main process in Electron. But then each renderer process you create, because you can create one or however many you want, each of those is like a new tab. So each renderer process is a separate distinct process, but they can all communicate with each other or communicate back to the main process. So who is in who is in charge? Like which which is the boss process? The main process is the boss process. It spawns each uh each renderer process and it controls um closing the app and all of those things and it handles all the CPU-intensive stuff like opening dialogues and things like that. 
Okay. So if I was going to write a Electron app that had to think really hard, mm-hmm. the the non-renderer process would do all the hard thinking and they would communicate with each other. Yes. And another thing you can do that people sometimes do is to just create an invisible renderer process because it's up to you to decide if you want this new window to be visible or not. So you could have one visible window that was your main app that people saw, but then you could spin up an invisible window and sort of farm off tasks to that renderer process. So you don't even have to do, there's some things that have to be done in the main process, like all the all the calls to the native UI elements, like an open file dialogue and all of those things have to happen in the main process. Um, but if you just want to write a bunch of intensive JavaScript mm-hmm. and open up a new renderer process, you can make an invisible one, do heavy calculations, and then send the result back to your main visible window. That way, all the stuff you're churning is happening in the background in a totally separate process and not impacting your users in their main window. So how is the cross-process communication happening? Um, it's an ele- it's a built-in Electron module called IPC for inter-process communication, and you send messages on channels between the processes. There's a whole message bus that's all built yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. And that's not something that you get in Chrome for free. That's an Electron thing. Yes, yeah, see, it starts to come together. <laughs> I have to realize there's a lot more. So I went and uh, downloaded Electron Quick Start. Mm-hmm. It was like Git clone. I did it on Windows. I went Git clone. I went npm install, and I went npm start. And when I did that, I got a hello world, and then on the right hand side, it popped up the kind of the Node developer tools to not the Node, but the the Chromium developer tools to remind me that you know this is where you start. Yes. Um, it's got the electron icon. It's got a menu. And at this point, I'm kind of off and running. I mean, it was three minutes to get an app, a Hello World app going. Yes. And when I go in there, I notice that there's really just like three or four K of stuff. There's a main JS and a renderer JS, and that's like basically it. The thing that I was a little kind of bummed about uh, was the node modules folder has like 2,000 files. <laughs> That's just like node, right? There's nothing, that's just life. I mean, that, yeah, that depends on how many other things you're requiring. It, but this the, was this, the quick start. Right. So the quick start app is requiring Electron itself. So that's what it uh, is. The, okay. it's main, the quick start's main dependency is a module mm-hmm. called Electron Prebuilt, mm-hmm. which is a compiled version of Electron that's actually running that app. So uh, I see. the quick start okay. app really just includes Electron. So it's like 2K, this is kind of like, I think about things in the context of .NET, because that's where I started, where it's like, hello world is 2K, and then there's 150 megs of stuff that comes along, but that's just kind of like the runtime. Yes. But it's private, though, which means that I can have lots of different Electron apps, and they don't affect each other, right? Like, I can't break my Electron app because I installed yours. Right, yes. Yeah, each Electron app comes with Electron bundled in it. Okay, so then that means, do I have, what versions do I have to think about? Like, there's the version of Electron, there's the version of Node. Yes, and they share a V8, which is Chromium's rendering engine, and so, or JavaScript rendering engine. engine. Well, so so Chromium's the rendering and V8's the JavaScript. right? Right, right. Yeah, and so Node is built using V8 as well. And so in Electron, mm. they're sharing a single V8 instance. Okay. So the, okay, so the Node is there on top of V8. Chromium is also using V8. And the yes. Electron collaborates and kind of uh, uh, manages all of these different things working together. But those are the four versions of things I need to think about yes. when I take a new build of Electron. Yes, um, because there are... Mostly, I think it's to know what cool new things you can do um, because we're usually just a week or so behind stable Chrome updates. Mm-hmm. And so when cool things happen in Chrome, you can start building those things into your Electron app. And when you're building an Electron app compared to when you're building a web app, you only have to design for one browser, which is a really <laughs> freeing experience. Um, everybody will be viewing your Electron app using that version of Chromium 
that's bundled into Electron. And so any new features that are shipped in it, you can use. So like CSS variables exist in the latest Chrome, so you can use them freely without any kind of other dependency. You just use them. Um, over 90% of ES6 is inside of V8, which means it's inside of Chrome and Node at this point. And so mm -hmm. you don't need any um, compilers or anything. You can just start writing ES6. So does this, do you, this is more philosophical. Like, I don't mean to get all, like, bring it down for a second, but <laughs> doesn't this kind of get the sense that we could have a monoculture? Like, like there's, there's, there's opinions about the Chrome, the Chromebook, but what do we do when there's Windows, Linux, and, and Mac, and there are only Electron apps? I suppose that's good for you. You always <laughs> have a job. Well. Like, are there apps that you don't want to write in Electron? Um, mobile like, oh. apps. <laughs> you can't really think about it. You're like, well, but mobile apps you would use like, you know, phone gap. Right, or right. Something. Yeah. So it, I'm not sure the, the drawbacks really, because it, it's, it's really up to you, right? You have to be smart when you're writing an app this way, because it's not completely native development. You need to know how to write a good node app. And so there might mm. be situations where you think that your app is loading really slow, but really you have a ton of require statements happening at the start of your app that you can mm. minimize, that you can put into one JS file so that you're only making one request to the file system to start mm. your app. And so there are definitely ways to be clever and make your app really smart, but you can make a really fast app with Electron and anything that you can't write in Node, you can write a native module for and then use it in Electron too. So if there is something in particular that your app needs to do that can really only be done um, in the low level, you can mm -hmm. write that piece. Would you have to write it three times? No, just once. So I could write a native app, a native module, and then it, how will I get it to work on Linux, Mac, and Windows if it's native to those things? Um, it builds um, to the version of Node that is in your Electron. Okay, so let's say that like Mac came out with some new feature, like uh, I don't know what's a crazy Mac feature. I don't know. Let's just say like they have like Siri. Let's say that Siri, like Siri, is going to come to the Mac, right? Mm -hmm. And I want my Electron app to talk to Siri or do some kind of Siri-based thing. There, that's a totally native, totally Mac, totally OS-specific thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I would write a native module that act as a bridge between V8 and JavaScript and Siri, and I would build it, and then I would just detect that I'm on a Mac and light it up if I was on Mac. Yes. Um, well, that one in particular... Like, that, is that a weird thing you want to do? Not necessarily, and actually that's something that might land in Electron Core um, because really anything that is native on these operating systems is something that might as might belong inside of Core. Anything that you could write a JavaScript node module for really doesn't belong in Core, but the bindings to native um, UI elements is something mm. that Core is handling for you. Um, right. So it really is like if you're doing something with audio files that you really need to write in a native language, you can do that and then mm -hmm. compile it um, so that it works with the version of Node that is in that version of Electron that you're building your app against. But a lot of the stuff that's native to the operating system gets built into core. And so something that's cool and happening now is, um, as I mentioned, like Electron was built originally for Atom. And so a lot of the APIs are really specific to building a text editor. But now mm -hmm. people are building tons of other things on Electron and they're contributing these um, native APIs back upstream. And so... There are so many more things that exist in Electron now than existed a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are platform specific because, you know, while every platform has an open file dialogue, 
they all don't do notifications in the same way, for instance. Right, exactly. Yeah, notifications. I'm, I'm, I'm a Windows 10 user and I'm a fan of Windows 10. I like it when there's like a little badge on the icon in the taskbar that tells me like, you know, how many mails I got. That would be a cool thing for Electron to implement where yeah. I can have a badge. It does, yeah. So notifications exist to varying degrees depending on um, like what Windows version the user is on. But they do exist for um, OS X. Um, and then there's things, you know, that are really specific. Like on Mac, you can have a dark or a light menu bar. So there's an Electron API to detect like what theme your um, user has. And I think a similar one exists for that in Windows too. So there are actually platform specific APIs because, but in general, Electron is covering this native area um, in okay. terms of doing all the communication, communicating for the native UIs. What about the situation where I have a kick ass, uh, or sorry, forgive me, I just said ass on my own show. Um, you know, a really awesome web app. Like I think you like Outlook, like Outlook.com, the Outlook web app is like legendary. Like it, Gmail hasn't changed in years, but Outlook.com is like amazing. I want to make that an Electron app, but that's not really the same. Like there's, there's taking a website and putting it in a pretty frame. And then there's really taking advantage of like you just described all the native kind of stuff. If I have a really awesome web app, can I port it or bring it in and start lighting it up? on Electron? You can. Um, the first thing you could do, because you can actually, if you just want, if there's a website you use a lot that you just want to act as a standalone app in your doc. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, I totally have. I could think of like five. Yeah. So instead of loading a local file in that Electron Quick Start, you could just put in a URL to an existing website. And so... Whoa. <laughs> okay, hang on. Let me do that right now. <laughs> where, do, where do I do that? Um, in the Electron Quick Start, um, uh -huh. the main JS file, that is representing your main process. So all the main mm -hmm. process code is in there yep. and it has a line where it should say new browser window. And that's okay. the main process spinning up um, a browser window, which is the renderer process. Yeah. And in that you can pass, yeah, there it is load URL. Mm -hmm. You can pass a ton of different options about oh. what size it is, if it's see-through or not and all kinds of stuff. But at minimum you can say how big it should be and um, what, what's the HTML and that HTML could be local on your system in your app, mm -hmm. or it could point to an actual live website. Whoa. I just did that. <laughs> and so I just, I just made one for the Azure portal. Nice. That's so cool. So WordPress actually is an electron app. Now they've made a desktop version. Oh. And so something I think that's similar to what you're talking about, where you can take a web app and mm -hmm. then start changing things over where people don't have to drag and drop files onto a website. I mean, yeah. they still can, but sure. you can actually then use the native open file dialogues and things like that. Okay. So this, okay, good. So then I, I would have my existing web app that that would you know could still be visited on the web but then i would bootstrap it or kick it off with electron and then i could add my light up things can they talk to each other like i'm loading a web app but i've also got local code running how do those process you know, how does the server side and the, and the client side know that like how does my website know it's in electron and start i start communicating with it um well your website wouldn't know it's in electron because at that point it's just a Chromium window doing what it does, which is drawing a web page. Um, but if you built APIs into the server of your website, certainly your, your Electron app could talk to that server. Okay. But I do have those two processes, right? I've got mm -hmm. the rendering one, which is now, you know, my blog. And then I've got the, the one that, you know, the, the invisible one. Couldn't it m monitor what was going on and, and change things and in inject things into the experience? Oh, definitely. Yeah. But um, 
that information is only happening on the user's computer. If you wanted that to like go back to the server that's running your website, then you need to talk to yeah, that. Then I but, need to go and yeah. make web API calls or whatever. Right. But yeah, you can have that one. You can use like any database that you like. I mean, you can use local storage, but you can also use whatever database you're comfortable using in projects. You can also just read and write JSON files to the user system. Okay, so then those are just now. Where are those going to go? Are they gonna, like if I put this in C program files, which is kind of like the mm -hmm. administrative place? I suppose I can keep my data in the user's profile folder. And there, there's an an API in Electron actually um, called Git App Path, I think, but it mm -hmm. that will retrieve exactly because when a user installs the app, depending on what operating system they're on and mm -hmm. how they install it, really, they could put it anywhere, right? Like on Mac, I don't have to have it in the applications folder. I could be running it out of downloads. So that API in Electron returns to you the path of exactly where your app is on the user system, and then you can save files there. This is really cool. And you wrote uh, a cool app with Electron to teach people how to use Git, Yes. Uh, called Git It, G I T dash I T. <laughs> and, uh, you and I are going to actually do a training on this in July, uh, teaching some folks how to use Git. Um, did that exist as a website before or did you write it as an app? Yeah. So that one was, that was a cool thing to turn into an electron app. So what it existed as before was, a node module that ran in terminal that actually had like a menu in terminal you could um, navigate through. And then oh, wow. the challenges. Like a BBS? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I just dated myself. <laughs> um, text-based, you know, yes. text-based windowing menu kind of thing. Yes, um, in terminal. And then it had a web guide that... Um, had the step-by-step -step instructions and the um, diagrams explaining, you know, exactly what you're doing, what is a cloned repository and such. So it was a whole bunch of uh, node files and then a bunch of HTML files. And it ended up being really kind of the perfect thing to turn into an Electron app because that's mm -hmm. all Electron is also. And so I, I really, I just, I, started with a quick start app mm -hmm. and I, I copy and pasted all of the HTML files into there. And then I copy and pasted all of the JavaScript files into it. And then it was just a matter of writing some more JavaScript to have them to add more elements because it used to be that you verified each challenge in terminal. You would type, get it, verify. Um, but so I had to build the verifying into the electron app. Mm -hmm. But I got, to, I was, it was a head start because all of the HTML was already written. All of the actual verifying scripts themselves that were JavaScript, all of those I reused. I just added the verifying like UI elements into get it. Very cool. And of course, we can see all of this at your website, J. L-O-R-D, jlord.us, and you've talked about it on your blog, and it's on your GitHub as well. Yes. And then one final thing as we close that I think is just a really cool way to bridge the web with Electron is the idea of a protocol handler. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could say something about that. Yeah. Um, Electron, you can create protocols and do those things in Electron, and so you can create a specific file type um, well, I guess you could, if you're, if you want your app to be something that is like the default app that people open PDFs with, mm -hmm. um, you can set that up. You can also create new ones. Um, there is a. So do you mean like, like Hanselman colon slash slash? Like right. You know, yeah. Exactly. Thing. Yeah. Um, and so you could create a website that used that URL that would then launch the Electron app on someone's computer. There is an awesome tool that I will give a shout out to <laughs> that we made called Electron API Demos. And that's on the Electron website. Mm -hmm. And it's actually an Electron app demoing the Electron APIs. And so it's really cool because it's got tons of sample code in there that you can just copy and paste into your quick start app. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it demos really exactly what some of these things are because sometimes, you know, 
there is confusion when you say, oh, Electron gives you use of native UI elements. Well, what does that mean? And you can actually demo and click like, oh, this like an open file, file dialog, a save file dialog, and that kind of thing. And so there is a demo there for creating a custom protocol um, that you can, that will launch your app. Right. And you can even do stuff like take screenshots or print PDFs. Yep. I mean, you know, it's a good reminder of like all the kind of native stuff. And then also all of that stuff we talked about, about uh, asynchronous, synchronous messaging uh, and communicating with the invisible window. Not only does it have demos, like every single one of them is live, plus it includes sample code. Yes. And a cool fun fact about this app is um, because it is an Electron app, all of the code that's actually running each demo, mm -hmm. and then there's the sample code given to you, that sample code is the actual code because we are just doing a read file and then no. add it to the DOM. And so that's cool. I know, I know. <laughs> oh, you're killing me. And it's cool in terms of um, sustainability too because you only have to update the code once and nice. it's updated in the demo. That's cool. Yeah. So it really is. It's meant to be, it's meant for you to copy and paste out of, um, all the sample, the, the sample snippets are in the demo app, like when you run it. But mm -hmm. we also totally recommend just cloning the app and looking through how we built the app as a best practice for building electron apps, um, in terms of how are we testing this app? What are the scripts that we're using to package it? We just got it in the Mac App Store. Um, so there's, That's really there's lots cool. that can be learned from just reading the code of the app itself. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me today. Yeah, thank you. Again, you can check out Jessica Lord on her website, on her Twitter, and on GitHub, and certainly check out Electron. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.